August afternoon in 2014, and I am very much pregnant with my first son. I'm sitting in my apartment in Los Angeles, California, watching streets across the US burn in a righteous rage after 18-year-old Michael Brown was murdered by the police in Ferguson, Missouri. My hands rest on my belly. It's that time of day where growing baby moves and flails the most. Today, his movements feel exaggerated, like they're matching my heartbeat as I anxiously watch the clicker tick across the news screen on my TV. Maybe it was pending motherhood or the gravity of bringing an innocent soul into an unjust world, but something about this particular act of state-sanctioned violence put the first conscious crack in my well-meaning white woman worldview. You know the one. A worldview that doesn't see color, that believes in the bootstraps version of the American dream, and with love and light, effortlessly reduces systemic racism to a set of particular circumstances that most certainly could have been resolved had we all been following the rules and getting along. Now, I don't share this story with you today because I'm looking for nice white lady points. <laughs> In fact, if I'm being honest, one of my biggest fears is being perceived as someone who's standing here simply to look good. I share it with you today because it marks a beginning for me. When I stopped seeing myself as an individual who was powerless in the face of the status quo and started to see myself as one part of the larger whole that together holds so much power to create change. Devoted activist Grace Lee Boggs once said, we cannot change a society unless we are responsible for it, unless we see ourselves as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. The status quo maintains power when you and I see ourselves simply as individuals who live in a society that has problems that are too big to fix. So why even bother? However, if we see ourselves, as Grace Lee Boggs suggests, as belonging to and responsible for that society, then we can see how our actions, or lack thereof, impact the world around us. I invite you today to consider the idea that when you are engaged in a diverse community, you are more likely to take action in service of that community. In the months that followed that hot August afternoon, the rhetoric online implored white women to put ourselves in the shoes of women and mothers of black and brown children to imagine what it must be like to live in fear daily that your child could die at the hands of a world that sees them as a threat for simply existing. These pleas were made in attempt to pull on the heartstrings of our humanity in hopes that we would finally rise up and stand next to communities of color and fight these injustices. But they were met with overwhelming emotions and a whole lot of tears that come from simply imagining injustice. But they weren't backed by the action that comes from the effects of feeling the injustice. I know this because I'm a white woman with a lot of emotions and an endless number of tears, and I hadn't yet found myself to a place of action because I didn't see myself as belonging to the collective that needs liberation until the November afternoon, three months later, when a grand jury declined to indict the officer that murdered Michael Brown. I sat in the same apartment, watching once again the streets of the US ignite in a righteous rage. This time, I held my one-month-old son in my arms as he fussed. I didn't need to imagine the fear of losing him in that moment because I was faced with a stark reality that I had given birth to a son who could grow up and take a life in a society that would not hold him accountable for it. It's with that realization that my worldview went from cracked to shattered. For those of us who were not blessed to be born into 
or who have not already connected deeply into non-white dominant communities. We have a lot of work to do. Everyone finds their way to that path in a different way. The important part is that we stay connected to that pathway. There are two words that I use that keep me connected to my path. The first is question. Early in my journey, I found myself in several online anti-racist spaces. I showed up, I did my homework, I participated, and I didn't really see any change in my day-to-day -day life. On top of that, no one was really like giving me high fives for being there or telling me I was great. <laughs> like, when were the gold stars getting me handed out? <sighs> the desire to be rewarded for meeting the bare minimum standard of humanity is baked into supremacy culture. But nobody wants to say that part out loud. In order to truly change, I had to be honest with myself. I had to answer the questions with honesty. And then I could start learning and unlearning new ways of being. The questions don't stop there, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it. Every strongly held belief, every certainty, every understanding of the norms in society and how society works, all of it has to be questioned because it's based on generations of oppressive programming that are inside of ourselves. The second word is engage. And engagement comes in two ways. The first is personal. We all have to start at the beginning. Sometimes that's the hardest part to know how to get there. It mostly begins with questioning. That's where the learning and the unlearning happens. But an important part of our personal engagement is personal responsibility for our own transformation. We have to take control of our own process on this journey. What does that look like? It looks like seeking out new ways of thinking on purpose. It looks like turning to Google to get your questions answered instead of that one person of color you know. It looks like learning from teachers of color and paying them market rate plus. It looks like being committed to a lifetime of questioning and engagement. The second part of engagement is community. Look around in your communities and find the leaders that are doing this life-changing work. They're definitely there. Be willing to put yourself out there and ask how you can engage. When I find myself in these places, I first make sure that my presence is supportive and welcome. I remind myself that I don't need to be the leader in every single one of these spaces. I ask what is needed instead of assuming. And then I do what I can within my capacity to meet those needs. When we are engaged, relationships build, new understandings emerge, and pathways forward become clear. In the book Sister Outsider, truth teller Audre Lorde summarizes the chapter on transforming silence into action by saying, for it is not difference that immobilizes us, but silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. When I prepared to stand before you today, I sat with the weight of all the familiar fears that would convince me not to stand here and stay safely silent. And in the stillness of those moments, my spirit reminded me that all of my fears live in Jen, the individual. What if I'm misunderstood? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I cause harm? In each of those fears, I'm rooted firmly in the belief that I have to have all the answers. White supremacy uses this idea to lure me in to inaction and to cause me to stay silent so that it can maintain its power. But when I hold myself as a member of the collective, the weight of those fears can lift, even if just a little. Because in the collective, there is space for understanding. In the collective, we hold space for learning and unlearning. So it's not that I will always say the right thing or always be understood or never act in a way that causes harm. 
The idea is that if we're in relationship, then we know each other. We learn together. And so when I'm called in to make repair, I trust you. I listen. Then we can know better and do better. As I close today, I'd like to invite you to meet me at the place where we decide not to argue in the comment section, <laughs> but instead meet for coffee. You can tell me about your family and that random thing that brought you joy last week. And I can share with you the thing that's been keeping me up at night. And you can remind me that it's okay to be vulnerable. And rather than me looking at you and deciding that I know how you show up in the world, let's have lunch. And let's find the place that marks our beginning of being not silent and choosing to work together in service of the liberation of this beautiful collective that every single one of us belongs to. Thank you.